Hi everyone, this is uh, Phil Travis, and um, this week's presentation is on um, the Holocaust. And really we're going to look at the Holocaust, there's really two um, kind of components to the Holocaust. On the one hand you have the component associated with the death camps, um, and then you have the, 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 the part that's associated with the so-called Einsatzgruppen. Uh, the Einsatzgruppen was... Um, um, they were mobile killing units that were used to go into Eastern Europe following the invasions of the Eastern countries, particularly Russia, and to begin uh, mass executions first of the male population of Jewish individuals and ultimately um, all of them, embracing what was called the Indoslung, which was the, um, uh, the, the so-called final solution, which basically refers to... Um, the Holocaust, which the Holocaust, um, you know, death tolls from that are estimated upwards over 10 million. Um, and the Einsatzgruppen was responsible for at least 1 million of that number. You see here uh, in the picture, you see, you know, one of the shocking images from from this event in history. Um, this is the Einsatzgruppen executing uh, uh, c civilians, uh, uh, Jewish civilians, um, into you know mass graves. The one thing we need to think about with this is why does this happen? Uh, what are the factors that make it possible for humans to commit genocide? So before we get to the discussion of the Holocaust, I wanted to just take a look at the more broad sort of consequences of World War II uh, for post-war Europe. Um, so. World War II fundamentally transformed uh, Europe, and um, it really marks uh, what might be called the destruction of old Europe. Um, at the end of World War II in 1945, we see numerous incidences of ethnic cleansing, and some of this ethnic cleansing is associated with anti-Jewish um, activity, of course, um, some of which was not perpetrated by Germans or Nazis. Um, but a lot of that ethnic cleansing, too, was focused on, on other groups. There were mass population transfers that were, that were forcibly driven at the end of World War II. Um, the leader of Czechoslovakia pledged to de-German, to, uh, to drive out all the Germans from Czechoslovakia. Uh, German people in Eastern Europe, who had been living in Eastern Europe for generations, were forced to leave um, you know, family ancestral homes. Um, they were forced to leave. So there's mass population transfers. Italians who lived in parts of the old Yugoslavia were forced to leave. There's mass population transfers. And in the process of these mass population transfers, as well as uh, the massive death toll that results from the Holocaust and um, the, the, the ethnic cleansing of the war and the immediate post-war, we see the emergence of a really fundamentally less diverse Europe. Europe, old Europe, used to be sort of associated with these old sort of trade crossroads cities like Trieste or Sarajevo. Um, these were cities that were associated, they were on trade points and they were associated with sort of being semi-autonomous, not within a particular country, and associated with, you know, being very diverse. They had, you know, a myriad of religious and ethnic groups within these cities. At the end of World War II, this really all changes. These cities become incorporated all into formal countries, and um, their makeup becomes fundamentally less diverse. Um, in some cases, the loss of diversity in Europe is because of the Holocaust, the tremendous death toll enacted on Slavic peoples, on Jewish peoples, and in many cases, um, you know, uh, everyday Europeans are complicit in the Holocaust as they, um, you know, take pseudo-legal action upon themselves and they take residence and effectively move into the former homes and establishments of those that have been, you know, um, removed as a result of genocide during World War II. Um, and so you see a diverse population sort of moved out. And in many cases, you see a now less diverse population of individuals moving into these countries and into these cities as 
as countries sort of drive population transfers and, and we see ethnic cleansing kind of happening across Europe. Uh, so Europe becomes less diverse. We really see the destruction of old Europe. Um, in, 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 the, in the wake of uh, an incomprehensibly destructive conflict. Um, cities are destroyed. Berlin was 75% destroyed. Um, Aust like Vienna, Austria was maybe 20% destroyed, which is minor compared to the destruction wrought on, on cities like Berlin or Dresden, for example. Um, there were some of the old cities that uh, were, were untouched, Oxford, for example, Paris, Venice. Um, but much of European cities are completely destroyed. Uh, there's mass homelessness. 40 to 50 million um, were homeless in parts of the USSR and Germany um, combined. 40 to 50 million people homeless in the USSR and Germany combined. There is a complete collapse of European economies. Um, if you had anything left, it was now worthless, uh, particularly if you were German. Uh, this, your money was worthless and the currencies were worthless. And to such an extent that, um, you know, that you, people lost their life savings um, if they had any left. Um, and if you had anything left, there wasn't anything to purchase anyway. Economies have been completely destroyed. There is no farming. There is no, you know, there is no economy. Um, there is looming massive famine and an, un, an incomprehensible amount of homelessness that really is overwhelming to the Allies who are now dealing with this. Um, you know, a statistic to this respect is that um, even though um, we usually don't think about this with relation to the Holocaust, because we assume that when victims of the Holocaust were rescued at the end of World War II, that, you know, that they all, you know, went to the Allied lines and, uh, and, and, and lived. And the reality is, is upwards of 40% of Jewish individuals that were rescued um, succumbed because their malnutrition and their illnesses associated with captivity were beyond the ability of allied medicine and food to, to, to care for. And so there is a tremendous crisis on the, on the, on the, on the four um, at the end of World War II. So in a broader sense, we see the destruction of old Europe. We see the emergence of a less diverse Europe. We see uh, formerly diverse cities, in many cases depopulated, and now um, less diverse European populations, you know, French or German or, what, or, or, or Czech, moving into these cities. We see um, less diverse cities, less diverse countries. Um, unlike World War I, where we saw radical redrawing of the political boundaries, particularly with the destruction of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German Empire, um, after World War II, uh, political boundaries remained more or less static or status quo, albeit many of them fell behind what became known as the Iron Curtain. And of course, Germany would be divided along East and West. But by and large, many of the, the political boundaries did not change. But those countries that were within those status quo political boundaries themselves and their cities became less diverse. And this was a real shift um, away from old Europe. So old Europe is really truly destroyed. Uh, many of their cities are literally destroyed. Uh, diverse populations are eliminated. And, um, you know, in its, in, in its immediate moment in 1945, you see the, you know, the real, real um, um, danger of an of a, of a incomprehensible crisis. Mass homelessness um, all across Germany and Eastern Europe. Um, collapse of European economies and massive and in, 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 in incomprehensible scaled famine looming as well as myriad cases of ethnic cleansing going on all across uh, European countries. So uh, World War II really is of massive significance to the post-war period of Europe as Europe is really torn asunder and uh, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war, there are massive problems that must be dealt with. And, of course, the United States and the Allies and, of course, the Soviet Union will uh, pursue various methods of dealing with um, uh, these issues. So, first thing I want to talk about is I want to mention some of the Holocaust myths 
Um, so when we think about the Holocaust, um, what are some of the commonly associated myths that we usually might, that people have at times accepted about the Holocaust? Just take a second. So I think the primary Holocaust myths that usually come to my own mind are the idea that ordinary Germans did not know this was going on. Or that only SS members did the killing. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that there were a lot of, quote, ordinary people that committed a lot of the killing of during the Holocaust. Uh, they were not just SS members, um, but rather there were many ordinary Germans that were complicit in it. Now, also, G G Germans did resist this. Uh, many thousands of Germans uh, sought to provide refuge and ultimately escape to Jewish individuals facing the Holocaust. And while it is, it is undoubtedly true that, uh, generally speaking, the specific nature of the Holocaust, which was occurring largely in the Eastern theater, was probably not specifically known by most Germans. There was no question that Germans understood the, um, the elimination of Jewish people from the population. There was no question about this. Um, hence why people were trying to save them. Um, Jewish people were carted off to ghettos, and from ghettos they were trained to camps. They were taken on railroad to camps, and they never came back. And so these were things that ordinary German people absolutely, in most cases, would have known about. Uh, why, you know, would one look back and say, why did they stop it? And, uh, well, the, re the realities are very difficult. We have to remember those realities. Um, many Germans would have associated the Holocaust with just another part of the absolutely horrifying Eastern theater. Um, many Germans did resist the Holocaust as well, and there were multiple efforts uh, to try to kill uh, Hitler at this time, including efforts supported by some of his best generals like Erwin Rommel. So uh, Germans did try to do something about it, and in some cases, why would some Germans have overlooked this? And that really gets down to the general nature of the Eastern Front, the nature of the war, um, and the position in, 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 uh, of individual German people in German society during a time of war. Um, other Holocaust myths, the German army did not participate. Oftentimes it's assumed that the German army did not participate, when in reality the Weimark, the, the non-SS, the, 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 the army by and large, um, usually not considered Nazi in the sense of like an SS who's ideologically kind of constructed as a Nazi, I suppose, it may be more so than the, the average German soldier, but the German army did, in fact, uh, often facilitate and sometimes directly participate in killings associated with the Holocaust. Um, another myth is the Allies didn't know. Um, the Allies knew, um, to varying degrees, as the war progressed, progressed, what was going on and why the Allies chose not to do things like bomb trains to concentration camps or bomb... Um, targets around uh, places like Auschwitz um, are difficult to answer. It, it was a very, uh, the goal for the Allies was largely to win the war and win the war as quickly as was feasible. Um, but uh, it's, it's false that the Allies didn't know what was going on. Um, they knew that something of this nature was occurring, even though there remains still shock when the full revelations are, of course, made known because they're still beyond, I think, what anybody kind of comprehended. That's my own personal opinion about. Uh, so I think people knew, but maybe didn't know in a lot of cases the true kind of um, reality of this situation. Um, another myth is that Germans, only Germans were complicit. That's also not true. There were a number of different um, countries that became allies of Germany that were ultimately complicit in the Holocaust. Countries like Romania, for example, uh, who fought with, uh, with the Germans around the city of Stalingrad, as you saw um, in the film that we that we watched. Um, so Germans were not the only ones complicit in this either. So these are some of the predominant Holocaust myths that people often think about uh, when they think about the Holocaust. Um, there's probably some others you could think of, uh, but these are some of the most common misunderstandings. One of the big questions of, you know, studying a subject like this is why, you know, why... Could this happen? What could drive ordinary individuals to participate in mass killing, right? Uh, I mean, when you look at the images, and I'm going to show you some more images, they're horrifying, and you think about things like, sometimes you, you might see a video of the Holocaust, and you might see a bulldozer bulldozing um, 
you know, piles of bodies into a mass grave, right? And what you immediately have to think about is that there's somebody driving that bulldozer. What is it that can drive a person to um, so kind of eliminate the humanity of another individual to the point of being able to commit mass murder? Historians don't agree. I'll put all these up here. So historians don't agree as to exactly why these types of things are possible to occur. And of course, Germany is not the only place where we saw a genocide. After World War I, there was a genocide in Turkey. After the Vietnam War, there was a terrible genocide in Cambodia that killed 25% of the population of Cambodia. Um, so understanding these things is very difficult. Um, and usually historians debate what are the other of these two items. Um, and I think the answer is probably a combination of the two. Um, in one respect, um, something that could drive them to participate in this was the, the long-term ideological conditioning of Nazism, uh, which enhanced the idea that Jewish people or Slavic people or gypsies were lesser, in, in lesser humans, they were subhumans, and as a result were not worthy of the same kind of, of, of rights of other humans, this racial ideology. Uh, the Nazis promoted ideas that were associated with what's called racial hygiene. Um, and actually, uh, the Nazi euthanasia and eugenics program was really a precursor to the Holocaust. The Holocaust um, doesn't truly begin until 1941-1942 with, uh, with the final solution, as it's called. Uh, but Nazi eugenics programs have begun in the 1930s. And a eugenics program is the, uh, it's an attempt to racially engineer a... Um, a population, and so um, these were racial ideas. We had eugenics programs in the United States as well, and um, and actually the Nazis actually studied America's eugenics program. This is race engineering, so it's um, uh, an attempt to prevent reproduction or intermingling of people that are deemed lesser. Um, usually, those were people that were feeble-minded, as they called it. You know, they were mentally handicapped or something. And so, the Nazis, as well as before in the United States, um, there were sterilization programs of people that were considered to be feeble-minded. This was part of a, a more broad sort of eugenics and also euthanasia program. Um, and that's where the roots of the Holocaust kind of come from, linked to this kind of racial idea of racial hygiene, the idea, the ideology that. Um, um, you can't allow the so-called superior race to be have its gene pool pool like watered down by lesser races and by feeble-minded disabled people. So not that kind of ideology ideological conditioning was a very big part of this. You know, children in the Nazi movement were were conditioned ideologically from their very upbringing in the Nazi youth. Uh, there's also the factor of peer pressure. Um, when you see many of the pictures of the executions by the Einsatzgruppen, one thing you notice is that there's a guy doing the execution, and often there's a group of individuals watching. And so these killings were often up close and personal, and oftentimes every member of the group would be kind of uh, committing the act almost as a way of proving their um, allegiance to their group and submitting to authority and so forth. Uh, many also uh, because of the nature of extreme total war circumstances. It's probably a combination of these ideas that drive this type of mass killing. The Holocaust had an evolution. It, it developed over time. Uh, the concentration camp system really began to be organized in uh, 1933 with the beginning of Nazi power in Germany. But the concentration camps at that time were all, which were in Germany, of course, and they were all um, really for political prisoners as well as you know, many of the prisoners, there's lots of anti-Semitism in the camps, but they were, they were areas that were used uh, as they purged the country of communists and, and Marxists and socialists and intellectuals and so forth during the 1930s. Over time, the, the Germans became obsessed with the idea of the Jewish question, which was the idea, the, the goal of, of, of Hitler was to create in Germany and then in the East a large area where the population was was all what he deemed as the ethnic German Volk, the so-called Aryan. And um, the idea was you had to, you could not have German people living in, alongside Jewish people or uh, Slavic people. Um, and so you had to, or Polish people for that matter, and so you had to 
uh, take all of the so-called so-called subhuman races and separate them from the people that were considered to be of ethnic Aryan descent. And so as a result of that, this was the Jewish question. This was the racial engineering that we're talking about. They felt that they had to cleanse Germany of Jewish people. And they don't make the decision to begin gassing them initially. That doesn't occur until 41 and 42 when the gassing of the Jews occurs. Um, instead, what they started to do in the 1930s was to begin very repressive laws um, that would force many of them to migrate. There were theory, there were ideas um, towards 1939 of deporting all the Jews to Madagascar. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, one of the most common methods in the East, in places like Poland, um, as they tried to cleanse the, you know, the East, the area of Liebenstrom, of Jewish people and other so-called subhuman races, they started the containment of Jewish people in ghettos. And you see here on this map, you see a, a, a map of the Warsaw Ghetto. And so Germany is basically pushing all the Jews out of Germany and all the Jews out of the places that they're going to make sort of German empire, uh, German territory. Um, and so they were trying to get rid of the Jews by forcing them to migrate, by deporting them, and ultimately deporting them to ghettos. Ghettos were walled, um, they were walled areas, and uh, it was designed to uh, separate the Jewish population entirely from uh, the German population. Uh, the problem is, is as you move more and more people into these ghettos, uh, they became overcrowded. It was clear that you couldn't deport all the people to these ghettos. They had to be kind of overseen and... Um, it was highly problematic, and so they, they will look for another solution, and that's when they choose the final solution, which, of course, is the so-called, uh, is the, the final solution, which is the um, uh, so-called Indoslong, uh, which I believe is how it's pronounced in German, uh, the beginning of what we consider now the Holocaust. To give you an idea of um, what ghettoization looked like, this is the Laws Ghetto, um, and this ghetto is in the east. This came after the invasion of, of, uh, of Russia here in Operation Barbarossa. And you see the bridge where the Jewish individuals are walking over and the German individuals below. And the bridge connected two parts of the ghetto, these areas that were segmented off from the rest of the city. Um, another factor in why this is a, these are German soldiers, uh, SS officers, by the looks of their black uniforms, um, ridiculing a uh, Jewish individual in the Lost Ghetto. Um, when you look at the Holocaust, humiliation is often one of the ways that uh, um, that the, the, the mass killing begins to be justified in the minds of the, of the murderers. Um, Jewish people and other peoples that were subject to, to this were you know, often ridiculed and humiliated, and it was a process that was basically, it basically involved uh, desensitizing individuals to the humanity of other people. This is forced labor in the Ravensbrück uh, uh, concentration camp. This, of course, forced labor was a commonly used thing in the concentration camps. Most of the war materials that the Germans used, at least a large portion of them, were made by slaves. Um, in Volkswagen, uh, the people's car, um, Volkswagen, which was basically the Beetle basically developed during this time period in World War II, um, Volkswagen admitted, I believe in the 1990s, that uh, there were thousands of Volkswagens that were made by slaves and that a percentage of Volkswagen manufacturing in Germany were made by slaves in various aspects, people that were effectively part of the concentration camp system. The methods of murder in the Holocaust, there were really two main methods. The first method, and also these are both, you know, this is used throughout, but the first method of murder were the mobile death units, the so-called SS Einsatzgruppen. Um, the Einsatzgruppen, these individuals moved in behind the main invasion of the East, particularly Operation Barbarossa, and they would locate Jewish individuals and intellectuals, and they would execute them into mass, va mass graves. Um, over time, they expand the execution of Jewish people beyond just men, but also to uh, women and children. Um, they used gas vans as well. Gas vans were large vans with enclosed backs where the, the, the carbon monoxide from the exhaust was funneled into the back of the, of the truck, 
gassing the inhabitants inside, very much a precursor to the so-called, the, the, not the so-called, the uh, gas chambers that you see at Auschwitz. The death camps was the other way that the final solution was, was developed. The death camp system really is related to something called the Wan Sea Conference, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, in 1942, um, the death camps, originally six of them located in Poland, death camps like Auschwitz, Sobibor, Belsak, Majdanek, Treblinka, um, and Chemlo. Um, these camps all incorporated various forms of, of, of industrialized death. Auschwitz became the one most notorious for the gas chambers and the usage of Zyklon B, but overall that was ultimately extended to other death camps. And these six death camps were located in Poland. So just a look at Operation Barbarossa. Uh, Barbarossa, in a lot of respects, began the uh, the final solution. Um, and it began through the Einsatzgruppen, which predated, really, the usage of the gas chambers at Auschwitz, for example. Uh, the Einsatzgruppen, as depicted here, uh, you see the uh, uh, the five Einsatz, or, I'm sorry, the four Einsatzgruppen, so the different uh, areas they go into, depicted by the blue arrows. And these originally 3,000 men ultimately becomes as many as 7,000 men moved into the east and targeted um, the so-called uh, Utrmich, which were the so-called subhuman populations, and seek their mass uh, execution. The Operation Barbarossa was largely a kind of, in a way, a cover for this as well as a facilitator for this. Um, it opened up the war campaign and in, in some respects covered up massive death from outside coverage, and also um, it, it acted as a justification, if you will, for doing this. So it, 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 the Operation Barbarossa very much was a facilitator. It was purposely designed to facilitate this massive death uh, that was carried out in, a, in an effort by the, the German, the Nazis, to um, obtain Lebensraum, or living space. The process of killing uh, for the Einsatzgruppen was was face to face. It was intimate. Um, after 1940, after July 1941, women and children were included in the killing, as depicted here with a, um, uh, a German soldier shooting a mother, a child in the Ukraine. Um, so it was the Einsatzgruppe was a very face to face method of killing, and this actually was something that the architects of this campaign ultimately saw began to see as problematic because they feared the desensitization. Of, um, of, of, of German people that were participating in this mass killing. Here you see uh, Ukrainian Jews that are being shot by members of, of the Einsatzgruppen, mobile killing units. Um, and you can really kind of see, have a look at how uh, these, uh, these mass executions were carried out. Very face-to-face, -face, very personal, very intimate type of killing. And it is that nature that um, will encourage the development of the gas chambers, which they believe was a more detached way of carrying out the final solution. Here you see another example of the mass graves, as well as the humiliation of victims and attempts to uh, uh, dehumanize them. Uh, these women being photographed, being forced to pose for photographs bef before their execution. Um, the uh, uh, the Nazis were trying to uh, buffer their troops from the psychological nature of this mass killing. And so they uh, humiliated the victims, they dehumanized them, they segregated the people, they used auxiliary auxiliaries by bringing, bringing other people in and out, rotating people in the mass killing as an attempt to um, uh, you know, prevent uh, the psychological degradation of the people that were being forced to carry these acts out. This is uh, the total death for the Einsatzgruppen was upwards of 1.5 million Jews and, and over 2 million total. Um, as you see here, uh, another shocking image of you know, mass murder. Um, Himmler, this quote below, Heinrich Himmler was the leader, of course, of the SS, and um, Heinrich Himmler was really the architect uh, behind the final solution. 
Um, and here his, is his quote in which you could, you could read this. Um, the danger was very real. The line between the two potentials to become cruel and heartless and to lose respect for human life or else to become soft and break down is incredibly fun. To have persisted and at the same time to have remained a decent man. This is a page of glory in our history which never has been written and is never to be written. We must take the secret to the grave with us. Um, this is Himmler effectively saying this is like, you know, something we could never let anybody know that we did this. Um, it's kind of an acknowledgement of the cruel inhumanity of what was being carried out um, and acknowledging that they had, to have, they had to keep it a secret and no one could, could know. Here you see um, um, Hungarian Jews at Auschwitz in 1944. Um, they're making selections here. Um, they would take 10 to 25 percent of uh, incoming Jews would be chosen who would be able to be workers and they'd be chosen for slave labor and the rest would be sent immediately to the gas chambers to be um, to be gassed with Zyklon B which was a form of cyanide gas. Um, they chose the, this, uh, the gas chambers because they thought it would be a more efficient and humane form of industrial killing, meaning that they would separate the face-to-face -face nature uh, and make it a more uh, bureaucratic and inhumane process, and a detached process. Here is a photo of the villa at Wansee. Um, this is where they had the Wansee conference. And this is where they made the decision to begin the extermination of Jewish people in death camps. Uh, there were six death camps uh, in Poland. Belsak, Sobibor, Auschwitz, Chalmno, Treblinka, and Majdanek. Um, here you see, um, uh, this is from, Hall, this is from Aus Auschwitz, where it's a display of a pile of Zyklon B, Zyklon, Zyklon B canisters. This was the poison gas they started using. Uh, many of the other gas chambers and uh, other in the other death camps still used the carbon monoxide that was developed with the gas fans. But increasingly, Zyklon B, B the cyanide gas, um, which would be pumped into these shower areas. Typically, the people would be told they're going into the showers. They would be forced to strip naked, they would go into the showers and then they would be gassed with the cyanide gas. And here is a huge pile of, of the canisters, um, evidence to that fact. Um, towards the end of the conflict, there were efforts to, to kill Hitler, but the most notably the Vi Valkyrie plot, uh, which there was a movie about not long ago. And afterwards, when the plot failed, uh, the bomb did not kill Hitler in 1944, uh, individuals like Erwin Rommel was were forced to uh, commit suicide um, rather than um, you know face execution of himself and his family for being complicit in an attempt to overthrow Hitler. Here you see the Nazi death camp system. These are not all the camps, but these are most. These are the major ones. The blue camps are your concentration camps. The red camps are the formal death camps. The camps that were made for the purpose of mass industrialized murder and, and gassing. But of course, people were killed in these other camps as well. Here we see uh, uh, Jewish people waiting deportation in November 1941. So gathering point for Jewish residents of Bessarabia, which is yeah, a portion of Eastern Europe on the border of Romania in East near Ukraine. Uh, and this is September 1941. These individuals are going to be shipped off to the, the death camps. And here, of course, you see children being shipped off to uh, from the lost ghetto uh, in the East which, which was developed after the uh, invasion of Operation Barbarossa of Russia, and they're going to death camp. This was, uh, this is the last slide. Um, this is a resettlement um, facility. Effectively, this is, um, uh, the Germans were beginning their pursuit of the goal of Liebenstrom, 
And so they were, you know, beginning to resettle people into the areas that they had sought to depopulate and resettle with uh, uh, so-called ethnic, you know, German Volk. Okay, guys, I hope this is helpful. And, uh, you know, I hope uh, uh, if you have any questions, please let me know.